in recent years, uh, there have been quite a lot of interest in trying to identify uh, as well as characterize and, and understand some of the, the lowest mass galaxies of the universe. And we've had some nice talks on that this morning as well. Uh, and uh, I, I, as many of you are already well aware, there are diverse techniques to study the world galaxies. So, uh, did you catch my good side? <laughs> so, uh, so, for example, there are diverse techniques. Uh, for example, we've, we've seen this morning with uh, the community staff meeting history. Um, you, know, you, you can look at today's cell population of these dwarf galaxies and try to infer something about staff making history of these dwarf galaxies and hybridation. Uh, you can also, by looking at individual member stars, you can uh, measure the, the chemistry or the chemical evolution of these low mass galaxies and try to infer something there from the star formation history. Uh, or you can try and use the deepest images that we have at present of, of the high redshift universe and try and study these dwarf galaxies directly by looking at five sigma detections of light and the really, really high redshift and observations. Today I'm going to tell you about an alternative technique with which you can study dwarf galaxies at high redshift. Uh, before I get started, uh, if you can't see it, at the bottom of the slide I credit my collaborators who have contributed uh, significantly to this work, so Max Bettini and Gina Jorgensen, and uh, you do credit here. So for the uninitiated, uh, this is a dwarf galaxy. Uh, for the initiated, you might recognize this field as, as Booty's One. Uh, you don't actually see the dwarf galaxy until you uh, artificially enhance the, the member stars from this galaxy. Uh, and so the, the question here is, can we observe this galaxy at high redshift, redshift 3, to study it directly? Uh, and I think we all agree that this would be a very tough prospect to do, even though its visual magnitude is probably well below what we can have. So many people have instead tried to investigate other ways in which we can study dwarf galaxies at high redshift. Uh, and we've had some nice talks about the simulations this afternoon. Uh, this is one example by, by Sijin Shan, uh, simulated uh, seven dwarfs. And on the right, you can see the star formation histories. Uh, this is a batch from the dot, the blue and the red curves. And they fall more or less well within what is seen by these gray curves, which is the observations from, from the local universe. And you also saw this agreement with the simulation this morning. The thing is, what these, what these observations are telling us is something quite crucial. Uh, and so this is uh, Dan Weiser's recent work. Uh, and he's just subclassified into different, different categories. Uh, the point that you should take away is that these observations are telling us that dwarf galaxies are forming a significant fraction of their present day stellar population at Redshift 2 to 4. If you believe that stars have been formed in these galaxies at Redshift 2 to 4, which is what the observations are telling us, uh, such, as, such as the simulations, you can see a significant fraction here, is also true for the ultra faint dwarf galaxies, uh, as well as uh, dwarf galaxies we see this morning in the simulations, uh, dwarf spoilers are forming a significant fraction of their stars. Even within subparameters, there are galaxies that are forming a significant fraction of their stars. If you believe this, then we must be able to find the cold neutral gas from which these stars were formed out of at redshift 2 to 3. And that's the technique that I'm going to tell you about today, in which we can study the physical characteristics of the ISM of the dwarf and ultra faint dwarf galaxies at high redshift. So, is there a question? Is there a clarification? I, I, I missed that. Uh, seems that those, those stars were formed at the two, two to four or thereabouts, a significant fraction. It's formed, there's large diversity, right? There's a significant fraction of forming their stars at quite early times, between redshifts two to four. And it's about trying to find the gas cloud from which those stars can then.
gas phase forming objects which are low mass, which then will grow their mass with time to get to Gashi Field rather than seeing the change of gas that we want to do today. This, this, the, the top panel here, these are the observations. So maybe we can discuss after them. I'm not making don't understand the question. Sorry. Um, so anyway, so I think we can find these uh, these cold neutral clouds of gas amongst the population of downline analysis systems. So if we are initiated, uh, this is a downline analysis system. You see there's a broad absorption drop here. Uh, one of the main properties is that they're self-shielded. So the gas is shielded from background ionization uh, and it allows the gas to be cold and neutral and it's conducive to forming new generation stars. All right, makes sense. So many people have studied this in simulations. I couldn't put all of the simulations on the slide, but I quite like this one from Andy Thompson quite a few years ago. Uh, the reason being is they show this plot uh, on the right here, which is effectively the halo mass function multiplied by the cross section of hydrogen uh, of that damp line analysis. Uh, and what you can see is damp line analysis systems can be anything. They can be a 10 to 12 solar mass galaxy, they can be a 10 to 9 solar mass galaxy, probably even further beyond those extremes. But what it's saying is typically uh, the largest cross section times the, the, the number of those galaxies is, is about 10 to 10. So we're talking about a four max like uh, system uh, at which three. Uh, there's also you know, evidence that the dwarf galaxies, if you look at their redshift evolution of their metallicity or typical metallicities, they're about 30th of solar, they grow to be about a tenth of solar, average is zero, uh, which is again something like four max. And what I'm interested in today uh, to talk about is the lowest metallicity uh, DNA. So we're in this lowest mass DNA. We well, found quite a number of them, there are 20 that are shown here, this has been significantly updated since 2013. Um, but let me just give you a feel for the data. You get here is you get so quasar is going through this galaxy just by nothing more than chance, and the elements that are residing in this in this gas cloud are absorbing the background quasar's light, and you already see the most common elements: carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, silicon, and iron. So you get a rough idea of the chemistry of these clouds of gas, and you can also by looking at some of the properties of these absorption lines, you can get an idea of the physical conditions of this cloud of gas. So uh, by combining some of these elements, you can measure the, you can track the alpha to ion ratio as a function of metallicity. It's telling you something about star formation history. Uh, just in a, a very rough sense, there are type two supernovae, uh, and that typically produces an enhanced alpha to ion ratio. Uh, type two supernovae are the dominant produ producers of the alpha capture elements. And so at some later time, about a, you know, a year or so, when type one A supernovae start to kick in, uh, they don't produce any alpha capture elements, or very, very few alpha capture elements. And so you get a decrease in the alpha to ion ratio of the increase in ion. So this is telling you something about when type 1A supernovae started to contribute, or start to dominate the ratio of the ion peak elements uh, in galaxies. So here is the, the real data. Uh, what you'll see here, the gray is from uh, Kim Ben's work, uh, which is for the Milky Way halo stars. Uh, the DLAs are shown in the blue and the red points. So I've split the blue and the red points here, um, which is because in the, the blue points I'm using silicon and iron, in the red points I'm using sulfur and zinc. So two different elements to trace the alpha to ion ratio. There are reasons for that, which are discussed in, in this paper. Um, there are some caveats of doing this, um, which we can discuss afterwards if you're interested. But the point is that halo stars don't look like DLAs in terms of their, their chemistry. Just telling you something about the star formation history is probably different in damp line analysis systems or in the general population of damp line analysis systems of these universities. Uh, compared with the galaxies that contributed the majority of the stars to the stellar halo of the Milky Way. We can also compare this to Evan Kirby's recent work. Uh, and so this is sort of dwarf galaxies, so we measure individual member stars, the chemistry of individual member stars, and taking the whole picture of this galaxy at different rates. Uh, so here the DLAs are just the black symbols, and the colored symbols are now um, the dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. And you can see that they have a, a drop in their alpha to ion ratio at around minus two or thereabouts. Uh, and this is telling you something like uh, DLAs seem to have a very similar star formation history to dwarf galaxies that we see around the Milky Way. 
Uh, and here's an example from uh, Louise Fargus's recent work uh, around N31, this is for N5. So then you also have these line profiles, so you get an idea of kinematics. Uh, little group galaxies here are the red and the green, and the green is just the Milky Way, and the blue shows the, uh, the depth by mountain systems. Now, there's nothing much you can take away from this, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't have more about this point, but the point is that uh, you're looking at two different ways of measuring this technique. Okay? One is gas, and one is stars. So you can't do a one-to-one -one comparison between these two things. The thing that you do know is that this gas is sitting in a potential. The stars are also sitting in a potential. And so in general, uh, you should be able to see that as you move to higher metallicities that your kinematics increases because you're in deeper potential. So this is effectively just the mass metallicity relation. It's been seen in stars and galaxies before, it's been seen in delays before, but this is what it appears to be like in the low metallicity regime. And again, the story is that at the lowest metallicities, they exhibit the lowest kinematics. So this is telling us again that the lowest mass uh, halos must be associated with very low metallicity. I'll skip over that. So uh, what is can do with these line profiles is also decouple uh, line profiles based on their thermal and turbulent broadening. So uh, your turbulence is, is constant for all of the elements. Okay? You assume that. And the, the temperature depends on the inverse of uh, the square root of the atom's mass. So by looking at the widths of the absorption lines of different elements, you can measure the temperature and turbulence in these clouds of gas that are forming the stars in, in the water molecule. What I find to be quite surprising is if you look at the typical turbulent from the parameter of the gas temperatures of these, of these clouds in very low metallicity environments that are completely different environments, completely different radiation fields to the Milky Way, they show very similar values to what's seen uh, within uh, other parsecs of the, of, the Milky, of the solar system. So it's quite surprising these are so different, uh, so, so similar. Uh, in fact, you can get a whole bunch of parameters. Uh, we list them all over this paper if you're interested. We get turbulence, temperature, we get densities, masses. We now know that these VLAs are held up by thermal pressure, not turbulent pressure. And we also get an idea of the Mach number of these gas. So we're actually probably, probably something physical about uh, what could potentially be the birthplace of the birth clouds, just the second stars. These systems may just be enriched by the first stars and nothing else. In fact, they may not even be a galaxy, right? They may not have even formed along with stellar population embedded in the dark matter table. So these may not even be galaxies yet. So I'm going to uh, just quickly wrap up and, and just highlight some of the main points that I talked about today. Uh, first of all, we conducted a survey to find some of the lowest metallicity neutral gas clouds at high redshift. And we believe that we found potentially the progenitors for the more dwarf dwarf galaxies at these redshifts. Um, such as uh, Boogie's one, which I showed you earlier. We find good agreement between both the chemistry and the kinematics of the dwarf galaxy population and, and the high redshift depth and alpha systems. Uh, some of the key physical properties of these second generation stars or uh, early star populations are, are encoded in this gas. Um, and just as an aside, uh, it turns out that these environments, they're so pristine, uh, they've barely seen a metal. So they've barely been processed through stars. It's also a perfect environment to try and measure the primordial abundances. Uh, the, the primordial elements that were produced just minutes after the Big Bang. And here's the idea I need this way. Uh, and just finally, the, the one take home message here is that if, if after this conference you still haven't worked on metal board delays uh, or dwarf galaxies, uh, you should be. <laughs> Cross section times numbers. Um, and 
it's not clear to me whether you can put a cross section of gas into the stellar mass uh, or halo mass. So I think that's that's the tough step. Andy, you would be <laughs> you would be better suited to answer that question. I think it's a simulation question, but it's a really not necessarily for these observations. What is there? Stars, uh, silicon and sulfur are produced in about solar proportions overall, independent of the progenitor mass of the star, independent of the energy of the fusion. So I think that's a good assumption. But Ryan, zinc is not, no, the nuclear synthesis of zinc is not well understood. The, the zinc is the is the is the cap. Yeah. So silicon and sulfur is fine. And well, I was asking is given that your systematically the low the Milky Way at the height um, and elicit it. I was wondering if also for the Milky Way these two different uh, uh, indicators were used. Ah, the right. way they are. Yes, yeah, so for, for, for just these data here, yeah. uh, this is using the alpha elements like magnesium, silicon, uh, and calcium. So they're, they're using different. So. These, these using yeah, that. Uh, and in this case, we're using uh, silicon, uh, sorry, sulfur, which is traction silicon, and zinc. And so the caveat is zinc. Uh, in this case, if, if you look at um, the zinc to iron ratio in Milky Way halo stars, uh, what you see is that zinc and iron track each other pretty well. Uh, they're basically producing solar relative proportions. Um, it's not clear yet, and this is just because you know, there, are, there are very, very limited studies on this. In dwarf galaxies, we're not really sure what zinc and iron are doing. Uh, the other thing is that you, know, you have to be careful. These galaxies here, these are not dwarf galaxies. Uh, these are these delays are are in the, the upper end of the halo mass distribution. So it's over, these things are probably uh, more like Milky Way progenitors. They're not they're not all dwarf galaxies. It's not it's not a fair comparison. In other words, you shouldn't see this perfectly tracked because this is all this all different galaxies and, and star formation depends as you move along the sequence. Um, the point being though that it, it's I think it's certainly a fair statement that uh, these are elevated above these. Just because if you're looking at high mass progenitors, uh, the zinc to iron tracks about the solar ratio. Although in more galaxies, we don't know where that's true. We have uh, enough data to tell whether they might be satellites or sensors. So, what do they consider? Oh. So, so, uh, so that you can track, or you can't see the source. See some of the faintest things against some of the brightest things in the universe. Um, but in the few cases that you do see, a, you can associate a galaxy with a DLA. Uh, it's usually at large impact parameters, so it could be, it might not be that that, that galaxy you see at 100 kiloparsecs away from the cyclone is associated, it might be a different galaxy. Um, it could be a but it could, be a, it could very well be a satellite. It's, 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 they're, rarely, they're rarely seen with the host galaxies. If, if it's part of the thing that seeing against a really bright quasar, uh, but there's also the you know, when you do see it, it depends on the margin of the so. Yep, well, uh, actually, I wanted to ask a question about the growth of the version of H1. Oh, yeah. uh, that was usually, that was the floor of about 5 kilometers a second or 8 kilometers a second to be covered. And uh, then we seem to find something that was relatively. This is 
Yeah, but still, it would be taking something about that much more. 